Well, hey guys, I'm just going to do a, a little recap of where we've been going. So we've been continuing in our series of Hebrews called Jesus is Better. And last week, Steve preached um, from the passage that says, uh, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off anything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And such a powerful, powerful word. And I personally love whenever Steve preaches about running because he nerds out like super hard about it. And as a very reluctant runner myself, like I can like get passionate about running when somebody else who's passionate about running talks about it. Um, but just this week, I've been thinking about like those things that are hindering. He talked about like those things that are hindering us um, that aren't necessarily sin related, but just taking a closer look at throwing off that sort of dead weight and the things that weigh you down and um, that's been something that's been stirring on my heart this week. Um, but we're continuing in our series, and Neil is going to come, and he's going to speak on God's discipline. Uh, but don't worry if you guys looked at your um, uh, sheet, your announcement sh or your sermon sheet. The title is called "God's Not Mad," so I assume that he's going to tell us that even though we're getting disciplined, it's not from a place of anger from the Lord. So, um, with that, I'll let Neil come. And um, as Tap said, we're continuing in our series that Jesus is better. It's from the book of Hebrews, and today we're going to talk about a really light subject again, like I said, the discipline of God in chapter 12. Um, I don't know about you guys, um, but when I was a kid, I, I would do just about anything to get out of being disciplined. How many of you guys as children were like, hey, I just love it when I do something wrong and my parents discipline me. Anybody? Don't raise your hand or, because that means you're strange and you're acknowledging that, okay? So nobody liked that. I would do just about anything to get out of discipline. Um, I was always jealous of my friends who had parents that were extremely permissive. Do, do you know what parents I'm talking about? They're the, they're the parents that when I was probably like at the end of high school, um, when, when I'd stay over at my friend's house, the parents wouldn't care what time we came in. They, they, we didn't have to sneak out because they didn't care that we were gone. And, and, and they would even do really cool sounding things like say, hey, I'll get you a 12 pack if you'll just stay in the house and drink with us. And I was just like, what kind of awesome parents are these? They even buy us beer and they just tell us to stay in the house with them like this is amazing. Of course, we didn't stay in the house. We just waited till they went to sleep and then we did more bad things out while we drove. I mean, how foolish, right? But I thought those were the best. They were just the best. Nothing but fun to have. No limits, no discipline. Um, nothing negative, just endless parties where the only limiter was how long we could stay awake, right? Man, what awesome parents, right? Isn't, that, isn't this really the snapshot of the human condition? We want to live life on our own terms. We want to do what we want, with whom we want, whenever we want. We, we don't want to have any consequences. And we get excited when there are authority figures in our lives or those who actually should have authority in our lives when they just let us get away with murder because it feeds that view that we all have innately that we get to define our own reality. We get to choose our steps, and it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about it. Anybody in authority, they just don't understand our vibe. They don't understand what we're made of, and we're going to do what we want, when we want, and to heck with everyone else. How many of you guys felt like that when you were, when you were in high school or college? I did. Those of you who didn't grew up um, in, in like the, the six families that started the edge, right? <laughs> right? All of you guys are like, I saw those people and, and we knew how bad they were, but we kind, of, we kind of wanted to do that too. But then there are consequences. We all have consequences. The word, it just sort of, you hear consequence and it just kills that party vibe, doesn't it? You're like, consequences? Oh, man. It just kills it. It, it, it. it does that because our behaviors, our choices, <clears throat> our decisions, they set things into motion. We, we don't have control over it. It's just the design of life by our creator, whether we like it or not. There are things that happen when we choose to live a certain way. There are things that happen 
and that's just the way life is designed. I've noticed uh, that maybe discipline is better than I thought, but that's hindsight, right? Discipline might be better than I thought because with discipline comes order, and with order comes this sense of peace that can't be bought by any amount of money or by the cool parents that are extremely permissive, the ones that I knew in my teen years. Let's invite the Lord to, to speak to us today about his discipline in our lives. Let's grab a hold of what he has for us. Father, we all have different views on the subject of discipline. And for many of us, we have skewed views because people, uh, people that had authority over us, um, they, they, they used it in a, in a wrong way. They didn't understand what discipline was about, and sometimes that came out on us in anger. They misused their authority. And Lord, some of us have a, a, a bad idea of discipline um, because uh, the, the people who disciplined us, uh, they, just, they just missed the mark. They didn't mean to. They called it discipline, but they missed the mark because they're human, just like we are. So Lord, I pray that today you would prepare our hearts to hear and to receive what discipline means according to you. Help us to, to live by your word because you're not going to do something to us Help us to receive it today. Open our hearts and open our ears and, and, and our wills, Lord. Soften them so that we can be disciplined by the one who gave everything for us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 4 through 17, it says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. Here's the thing. When we read the Bible, it's always of the utmost importance to understand the context it's important for us to understand the context so that we can apply the lessons from Scripture to our lives appropriately. So we always have to go back to the overall purpose of the book of Hebrews, and, and we say this every week to, to make sure that you're, you're tracking with it so that you apply it appropriately to your lives. The, the overall theme of the book is encouragement in hard times, to see beyond the pain and the persecution in, in life. This is what the Hebrews were going through. They were converts to Christianity in Rome. They were undergoing intense persecution, and they had a temptation because they were hitting roadblocks to turn back. They weren't understanding that, that God uses the pain, God uses persecution, God uses roadblocks, and he says, I am with you in it. Keep going because Jesus is better. Jesus is better than all of the other religious beliefs. He is better than going back to a life of comfort. He is better than going back to a life of no persecution. He's better than any other way. And as a matter of fact, he is the only way, the only truth, and the only life 
So why would you ever go back to anything else, no matter how easy that path appeared to be? Stick with him because he is better. We've talked about that a lot. But this passage digs just a little bit deeper to a place where reality collides with our, it collides with our faith journeys. And if we're being honest, like Ken and Ruth were today, it's often painful because life is hard. No matter what you believe, it doesn't matter if you believe in Jesus or not, you're going to go through hard times. So because of that, I'd rather stick with Jesus in the hard times. Amen? No matter what, you're going to go through hard times. We don't get to escape it just because we follow Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus promised us that we will go through hard times. John 16, says it. He says, in this world, you will have hard times. And then he says something really significant. He says, take heart because he had overcome this life. Doesn't mean you get to escape it. I wish we could. I wish we could press an easy button that staples easy button and escape the hard times in life. But we don't get to do that. It's a lot easier for us to look at the Hebrews and say, keep going, guys. Keep going, first century Christians. You're going to be fine. We see the end of the story. But that would be like them looking at us and saying, oh, you guys are going to be fine. And we're like, wait a second. You don't know me. You don't know my story. You don't know what I'm going through. Well, we certainly, we have to take a posture of humility when we look at what they were going through just as they would need to with us because no one has walked in our shoes, right? Just as we haven't walked in theirs. It's a lot easier for us to think of distant persecution. It's a lot easier for us to hear stories of children who need clean water in Africa than to go to Africa and to meet those children who are suffering through hard times. Once you get to know someone's story, they're no longer a distant, they're no longer this distant statistic that has no relevance to our lives. It's really hard when we get into life, isn't it? It's really hard. When the rubber meets the road, it's hard to keep our faith together when we deal with our real-life sicknesses, our real-life addictions where there's not always a happy ending, where death still reigns in this world, where work is hard and it's full of thorns, just like Genesis 3. Raising our kids, they don't always turn out the way we hope they will. And still believing that God is good and that Jesus is for us. And this is exactly what the author of Hebrews is inviting us into today. This is one reason I trust the Bible so much. Because God does not whitewash the story of Scripture, He doesn't whitewash the story of pain. He doesn't act like there won't be persecution. No, he faces the reality of life and he says, I am in the midst of every single thing that you are going to experience. And I will see you through. There are better days ahead, no matter what it's like in this moment. Someone here needs to to, to sense that hope today that there is a God who exists, who loves you, who is for you, who died on the cross and will walk over with you hand in hand into eternity. Let's take a deep breath and dive in. It's absolutely going to be worth it today, okay? Here's the first thing that I believe the Lord wants us to know today. God invites us to think and feel deeply about life so that we, we will be able to swim in the deep end with healthy hearts. Let me say that again. That's a mouthful. God invites us to think and feel deeply about life so that we will be able to swim in the deep end with healthy hearts. When I read the first verse, I hear it. This is how I hear it. I hear it with some serious snark. I don't know if it's the author's intent. I'm not suggesting it is, but here's how I hear it. It's almost like, hey, suck it up, buttercup. Life's hard, but it could be worse. You haven't started bleeding yet. That's how I hear it. I hear it's factual. 
And, and, and he's, 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 the author is going back and referring to the 11th chapter because in the 11th chapter, we're told about all of the heroes of the faith and what they went through and, and how they held on to that faith. And then it's like this. Let me break it to you guys. You haven't gone through that much. This is what, this is what 12 is, is sounding like to me. You haven't bled yet. Some of us in, in, in North America, in North American Christianity, we almost act like we're being persecuted when Starbucks doesn't make their cups red at Christmas. Or when the cashier at Walmart says, Happy Holidays. And you're like, I knew I wasn't, gonna, I wasn't supposed to go to Walmart. Let's start, a, let's, let, let's, uh, let's start a protest. Let's not shop at Walmart. There are plenty of other reasons. <laughs> you don't have to pick that one. But this was real life and death persecution. And it had to do with a stand, taking a stand on the side of Jesus that would cost them everything. It's almost as if the author is saying, listen, it could be worse. If that's all that was written, exactly half of this room would be satisfied. Because you are factual people. You're the people that hear the, the details and you would say, okay, I know what my mission is. It's to suck it up. So I'm going to suck it up because you live mostly in your head. 50% of the people live in their head. They, they hear the details and they say, well, I know what my mission is and now I'm going to march. And then you, you march. You're, 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 you're directed uh, by, by, by your thoughts. You're directed with logic. And then half of you would be like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know how that makes sense to them, but I need more than that because you're heart-driven people. You're people who live from your feelings, from your emotions. You, you need more. We ask questions like this. People that are emotionally driven ask questions like this. Why do bad things happen to good people? You're not really looking for an answer. You're really looking to commiserate. Why do bad things happen to good people? We're not as driven by the facts as we are by the narrative. We are story-driven people. And story-driven people don't make any sense to the ones that are logically driven. Neither one really makes sense to the other. And usually those two occur in a marriage. Isn't that God's sense of humor? He puts together men and women, which often doesn't make a ton of sense. And then he takes people that think completely differently and he says, and this is my idea of representing me on this earth. And we're just like, whoa, God, you think your ways truly are different than our ways. And in the very start of the passage, the Holy Spirit, through human authors, addresses both by saying, you haven't shed blood yet. In other words, it could be worse. So, so that's the, the, the brain-driven people. And then he says, have you forgotten what this is all about? This word of encouragement that addresses you like a father addresses his son. Now we're kind of talking heart. In this very early start, we address head and heart. Some of you have a negative connotations when you hear father, and you're like, I, I, I hear about this God who's a good father, but how do, I trust, how do I trust God who is a father when my father wasn't good? Well, let me just tell you this. When God speaks like this, he's talking about fathers who are protective. He's talking about fathers who are kind. He's talking about fathers who are firm, solid men who love their kids all the way to their God-planned potential. And if your father isn't like that or your father wasn't like that, I am so sorry. He failed you. You didn't do anything wrong. But God still loves you and he wants to reveal his heart and his love for you. Remember, it was Jesus who said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. God wants us to understand the reality of the story that we're in, and he wants us to do it not with, not with, um, uh, not with bitterness, um, not with denial, but with an acceptance. He wants us to face the reality of the story that we're in with an eye toward what he has done and is doing in the midst of our pain points in our lives. He doesn't want us to pretend like it, it didn't happen. Oh, here, here's what I mean by that. 
You've gone through something horrible. You, 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 you went through the worst abuse that exists on this earth. And then you come to church and you see people that are raising their hands and, and they're praising God. So you think that, that you should probably just do that. You're going to mimic them. And, and then it, 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 you're really hoping that if you raise your hands high enough that that pain's just going to melt away. And God says, no, I want to walk with you and hold your hand through that pain so that when you raise your hand, your burden is truly lifted and you are changed and you are praising God because you know that he saw you through that pain. Don't deny it. Walk through the dark valley. He is with you. Do not deny it. He wants to see you through it. He also doesn't want you to be someone who just tries to, try, tries to, to have a lot of feelings without any knowledge of the word. We get really led astray in that way too. We need to know doctrine. We need to practice sound doctrine and then let our feelings connect with that. He wants both things acceptance with an eye towards who he is, what he has done, and what he is doing in our lives. Here's our second idea today. God invites us to see our lives as he sees. God invites us to see our lives as he sees. You've heard the saying, of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. Everybody's heard that, right? What exactly does that mean? It means when you look back at, at something after it's happened, you have a clearer view of the, the, the moving parts. You have a clearer understanding. You, you, you feel like you have a clearer understanding of intentions and purpose, and there's a clarity that comes in, in, in introspection and in retrospection. You look back at something, and you say, okay, now I can sort of dissect that situation and understand it. And, and, and we just wish that we had that kind of crystal ball for our present moments, don't we? We kind of wish we could operate um, in, with 2020 vision in our, in our current lives. My mom said years ago, I don't know if she'll remember this, but she said this to me years ago, you know that you're getting old when you start commenting on the leaves changing colors in the fall. I'm convinced that's true. And here's uh, why I know that I'm getting old. Because the teachers that I had in school who were the hardest, the ones that I'm telling you I just couldn't stand in the moment, the ones that I wanted to escape from, I, if, if my parents would have taken me out of Mr. Short's homeroom and put me in a Mrs. Stevenson's class, I would have been like, if I could have skipped Bill DeLong for my, uh, for, as my supervisor in my master's degree when I did clinical pastoral education, I'm telling you, that would have made my, my 10 weeks. But I, but I look back now, and I'm super thankful for all those people that were challenging to me. And here's why. Because they're the ones that helped me to reach my potential in the Lord, even the ones who weren't Christians. Isn't that something? God uses everything, every single thing. Bill DeLong, he was the supervisor for clinical pastoral education for me at Broman Hospital in, in Bloomington Normal. I'm not even kidding you. He seemed to have no mercy, like none. Um, uh, he had a, a doctorate in counseling. Uh, he was the quintessential counselor. He could see through you. Um, he, nothing escaped his attention. Um, he, every single time I would sit with him for a debriefing, I would go in feeling completely unemotional and he would make me cry. I would be so embarrassed that Dr. DeLong could do this to me. And I am not kidding you, I almost quit every single morning. I tried to figure out how I could do anything to get out of seminary so that I could just get on to the work of serving the Lord. I'm really not kidding you. I went, on, I went on the Billy Graham uh, Association website and I looked for jobs that, that would pay me nothing because I just figured I, school must not be for me. It's just time to get busy in, in serving the Lord. And God's like, no, you need this hard training so that you can do the thing that I've actually called you to do. And guess what I find the most significance in in all of ministry? It's sitting down and helping people take next steps in their life or get through the pain points of their lives by doing, guess what? 
what Bill DeLong did to me. The guy that I I literally could not tolerate when I was there for 10 weeks, 100-hour weeks, was someone who I look back at now and know he was one of the most significant shaping forces in my life in the ministry that I have today. So what about you? Could that one difficult person, you know who it is automatically, that job struggle, your financial problem, the health crisis, the drunk driver, could that one thing actually be used by God to get you to become the person he made you to be? Now, in my feelings, I feel like that's impossible. But here's what I've learned. Feelings are a great vehicle, but a horrible driver. God wants us to be connected with our feelings. He also doesn't want our feelings to to run roughshod over our lives. Because if you allow yourself to be directed by your feelings, guess what you'll do? Whatever you feel like. Whatever you feel like. Well, guess what I feel like every day? Eating stuffed pizza. I, I, I sometimes want Portillo's for breakfast. I could do a chocolate cake shake now. Carbs all the time, fat all the time. I could do all those things. If I go with my feelings, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to turn my, my life into a dumpster fire. Yet God does not want me to be disconnected from my feelings. God wants me to acknowledge my feelings and he wants me to allow my feelings to connect with what he's doing in this world. When we go through hard times, we, we tend to, to kind of get anesthetized to life. And what, what does that mean? For me, it means I get a little bit numb when I watch story after story of, of evil that seems to speak louder than the Spirit. And I, then I'll say things like this. Well, I've just got to get myself to kind of turn off to all this. No, no, no. God does not want us to turn our feelings off to this. What he wants us to do, though, is channel it and connect it with him and what he's doing in this world. And he wants to use our feelings for, for things like justice. He wants to connect our feelings with what he's doing in this world. And it's never a disconnected, distant kind of God. It's never this theistic, theistic idea that, that, that God wound the world up and now he just stands at a distance. No, he is intricately involved in the world that he created. He's not standing at a distance. No, he is with us. And he's inviting us into this story that's bigger than ourselves. Do not disconnect your heart. Feel deeply and be guided by his truth. Verse 7, I believe, is the most crucial verse in the entire passage. It says, endure hardship as discipline. Wait a second. So, The hard things in my life, that's God's direction in shaping me. But what if they're not Christians? God, can you use people who aren't Christians? Yes. What what about that accident that happened? I thought that was just sin. You would never, oh no, I didn't do that. That's what God says to us. I didn't do that, but, but, but I know how to use it. I can take the worst day of your life and use it to shape you. And you didn't do anything wrong, and it's not your punishment. You're dealing with the sickness, and you're saying, why me? How come I'm going through this? Instead of, why not me? We're in a fallen world. God, what do you want to do through this sickness? What do you want to do through my hardship? What do you want to do through my financial struggle? What do you want to do with my obnoxious coworker? What do you want to do? What are you doing? Help me to see that and help me to keep my heart alive and my brain connected to it all. Help me not to to, to shrink back. Help me not to numb myself with substances. Help me to connect with you and what you're doing. Endure hardship as discipline. Sometimes when we hear discipline, for me, I think of it as a punishment. That sounds like punishment. It sounds like, God's mad at me, and that's not what that means there. 
Hebrews chapter 12, this is not talking about God being mad, but what it's talking about in one sense is that discipline is like a drill. You know those drills in school, tornado drills? You know, drills where you have to sit in the hallway and cover your head or, or go outside during the fire alarm. You do those repeatedly so that when something happens, if something happens that's bad, that you're ready for it. This is, this is the sense of discipline that God is talking about in Hebrews chapter 12. It's repeated practice to get you to learn how to respond to the pain points in your life in a new way. What if you looked at all of those struggles, all of those pains, and you said, I'm not going to any longer respond in the dysfunctional ways that I've always responded but I'm going to choose from this point on. It is, it is a choice. Don't go with feelings. Your feelings will never want to choose a hard path. But I'm going to choose to receive this and believe that this hardship that is experiencing is God's, it's God's drill to get me to learn, to, to respond in a different way. And when we do that, he says, you will have, it doesn't seem pleasant at the time. It doesn't seem pleasant at the time, but you're going to have a harvest of righteousness. Oh, that sounds good. I want a harvest of righteousness, but I don't want the pain. How do I get there, Lord? And he goes, there's no other way but to walk with me. This is the path that he's chosen for us in this world. The passage tells us that everything that happens is not an accident. Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Not in some things, not in the things that we enjoy, in all things, through all people, in all accidents, in every circumstance that comes your way in life, you can know this, that God is in it or God allowed it. And his point is to change you and to shape you so that you will have a harvest of righteousness. And you know what that means? Just picture Jesus. Every single thing that's happening in your life, if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, there is no accident in your life. Every single thing that is happening is designed to get you to look more like Jesus. There's not one thing that has happened to you that is out of the, the scope of God's sovereignty. And it doesn't mean that he caused people to sin against you. It doesn't mean that you did something wrong and you are an object of his wrath. No, Jesus was the object of God's wrath. He took the punishment that was ours. He is just directing your course and sanding off the edges. And he's saying, and while I do this, keep your head and your heart connected so that you're going to swim. It. When you swim in the deep end, you're going to have endurance and you're going to be healthy. It's why after being betrayed by his brothers, and being a victim of human trafficking. That Joseph could look at his brothers and tell them it was okay. And here's what he wasn't saying. He was not saying what you did to me is okay. No problem. No, what they did to him was evil. But he knew that God was in control of it all behind the scenes. And that his purpose was fulfilled through the bad acts of people committed that people committed against him. Genesis 50, 20, I just love this. What a humble and strong response to pain. You intended to harm me, but God intended for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Do you hear Jesus in that story? What people did to Jesus was unfair and it was wrong but it was God's plan to redeem us. And we're going to go through 
pain just like Jesus did. If he is our master, if he is our Lord, we're going to go through hard times just like he was because Jesus was shaped in this life. Why do we think that we're going to get a pass to not be shaped by hard times too? So we are. And we can say, you intended to harm me, but God used it for the good that's being accomplished now to save many. His purpose in your pain is not just for you, it's for everybody around you. Here's what else I know. We're never going to see fully until we cross over. But God lets us in on this beautiful little secret that can change the way we live and process our lives when he says every single thing that comes into your life or goes out of your life pass through me. Nothing escapes his attention And that can be painful, and we can wonder why. But we can trust the one who gave his all for us. Here's our final point today. God invites us to live more like slow cookers and less like microwaves. God invites us to live more like slow cookers and less like microwaves. Technology is great until it fails, right? All you have to do is go to McDonald's, and watch the register stop working. And then you see this look on the cashier's face like, I've never dealt with money without my register. And that can test you like almost nothing else. It's great until it fails. Social media is great until people get all keyboard cowboy on you and say things to you they'd never say in person because they lack socialization, because they don't know how to have face-to-face interactions any longer. It can be great, and it can be bad. Microwaves are great for popcorn, but not for most other food. (laughs) And, and, And I want you to think about the results of microwave food, particularly Hot Pockets and pancakes. Your first bite is so promising, and then your second bite resembles the Titanic iceberg. And you're like, how can two things that are so different exist within the same delicious pastry? <laughs> Your pancake, you microwave, they're a little better now, but still they're a little off because the, the outside, the first bite, it's soft, and the, the second bite, it's a hockey puck, and you're like, this is great for the hawks, but, but it's not good for my stomach. When we embrace God's discipline for us and in us, We don't take it lightly just to survive it, and we don't give up because it's hard. Then we receive what we've always actually longed for on the inside. We've become like Jesus with peace and with good character from the inside out. But that is not a microwave faith. It's a slow cooker faith. The author reminds us that when we live for, for just now, we get just that. We get now. And we get nothing in the future. We're reminded of Esau, who in a moment of hunger, he sold his inheritance for stew. Because he didn't place value on what was to come, but he cared only about what felt good now. Feelings are a good vehicle, but they make a terrible driver. But when we have a long view of life, we're not as threatened by afflictions, are we? Because no matter what, we know that we have a preferred future with a God who created everything and gave everything so that we could be with him for eternity. This long view is hard. The apostle Peter noted it in 1 Peter 4, 12, and 13. He says, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. All of us can relate to that piece, right? Right? Every time something happens, we're like, whoa, I didn't expect hardship in life. (laughs) And it's like, wow, we probably ought to pick up the Bible every now and then. It says, but rejoice in as much, in as much, one of my uh, favorite, I've got a love-hate relationship with that word, it's three in one. It's like the trinity of words. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. 
And James, the brother of Jesus, had a long view of life through suffering of his own. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, you guys know this well. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know <clears throat> that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I want to invite the band up uh, as we prepare to close. And I've got two questions for you today. The first one is for those of you who may be like me, um, you've resented the heck out of the pain points of your life. You just resent them. They're not fun. It's, it's natural. Don't beat yourself up for it, but it is the reality. You look at the, the, the hard times in your life and you've said, why me? more often than you're proud of in this moment. And, and, or you're just kind of trying to survive life, and, and then one day you, you have this idea in your head of floating on clouds with harps and angels, and you're like, I'm just going to survive this horrible life so that one day I can receive the promise. You just feel like you're barely surviving. And here's the question I have for you today. Will you take a step of faith today and confess to the Lord that you have not recognized the painful moments in your life the way he wants you to today? That you've grumbled and complained and said, why me, more than you're proud of today? But you're, you're confessing that today and you're saying, Lord, today I, I have a, a slightly different perspective. It's shifting. And I'm looking at it with your eyes, your 30,000 foot view instead of my finite view. And I, and I hear that every single thing that's happened to me or will happen to me has somehow, you're in it or you're, you've allowed it. And you promise that you're using all of those things that have happened to me to help me to become more like Jesus. So I confess that I've complained more than I've praised. And today I just wanna say, Lord, thank you for your grace. I thank you for the, the biggest pains in my life because you allowed those things to happen so that, that I would look more like your son and that's a good thing and that means that you're a great God and you somehow do this spiritual judo that I don't understand because you even use the enemy's strength and you turn it around on him and you use that awful energy and you turn it into something that's used for my good. Only a God like you could do that. And I give you praise for it. I'm not happy in it, but I'm happy with what you're doing in me through it. God, we give you praise for that. You're a good God. Will you give thanks in the storm? The second question is for anyone who has not yet become a follower of Jesus. Your life hasn't made a lot of sense. You've had a lot of pain points and you're either cold, maybe you're a little bitter, you're just confused and you're here today and, and you, you're, you're at the place where you're about to dare to believe that all those things that have happened have purpose. The person who should have loved you the most, who harmed you, it still had purpose. The long period of joblessness, it had purpose. That health crisis, oh, it had purpose. That coworker that just sanded you down, oh, it had purpose. You're about ready to dare to believe that there is an author that's created your story. If that's you, I want to encourage you to take that next step. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. God is speaking to you. Will you say yes to Jesus, the maker of every moment on your timeline? If you'll do that, here's how you do it. Acts 2.38 and 2.39. It says this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. 
it is God's desire for you to know him as the author of your story. If you've recognized for the first time in your life that God is in the storms of your life, or maybe you're praying that prayer for the first time where you're you're acknowledging him as your savior, we want to hear about that. And I I encourage you um, after worship to come up and pray with a member of our prayer team and share that you prayed that for the first time. Or if you've been a believer for a long time and you've said, why me a whole lot, I invite you also to come forward and share with our prayer team that you now, you're, you're, you're confessing to the Lord that you haven't seen the things in life that have happened to you as part of his plan to shape you, but you see it like that today. And you're giving praise to the God who sees the God who is with you in the midst of every storm from here on out in your life he is with you. I want you to share that with the prayer team and we're going to close in worship today.